Um, thank you very much, Shirley, for that uh, kind uh, introduction. And thank you to the BABCP for inviting me to Bath. I've never been to Bath before. It's, it's a wonderful place. And um, it's just lovely to be here. Um, as Shirley said, I've, I've worked in lots of different areas in clinical psychology, um, probably far too many. I, I spend most of my time now in a state of perpetual confusion. Um, but by far the most rewarding, challenging, and provocative area I've worked in is the area of ch child trauma, trying to help children and young people deal with life-changing events, sometimes in their darkest hours. And even though you sometimes only spend a few hours with these young people, and at most a few months, those interactions and relationships stay with you for years and, and decades. It's, it's a wonderful area to work in, but, but difficult and challenging. Um, and what I wanted to do was share some of the fruits and insights from that work, work with you today. So I, I started in this area right at the beginning of my career. In fact, once I decided I want to, wanted to be a clinical psychologist, I was a PhD student, the very first area of clinical research I got involved in was, was child, childhood trauma. And so when thinking about uh, this talk and how to how to put things across, I thought maybe one way to do it would be to go right back to the beginning and talk about that narrative, because really it's a narrative about clinical translation, starting in the clinic with lots of conversations with people struggling with difficult things, trying to work out what's going on, moving towards experiments and studies, developing an intervention, trying to evaluate it, and the hardest thing of all, trying to get it implemented and taken up within the NHS. So I wanted to share that kind of narrative uh, with you and, and talk about some of the people I've worked with a lot along the way. So um, it, it all started in the late 1980s, so some of you can cast your mind back, but looking around, many of you weren't, wouldn't have even been born then. So Mrs. Thatcher was the Prime Minister. Um, at the time, we thought Mrs. Thatcher was a terrible Prime Minister, but <laughs> li little did we know. Um, Wimbledon won the FA Cup, I remember that year. Um, Cliff Richard was top of the charts. It, 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 it was heady days. And I was, uh, I was stuck for large parts of that year in a small room with Bill Yule at the Institute of Psychiatry. And I was doing a PhD, and I wanted to become a clinical psychologist. So I went to Bill, who was the world's busiest man, and, and still is, even though he's been retired a long time, and asked if I could get some clinical experience with him. He didn't hesitate, but say yes. And that says a lot about the person, and he, he was a great mentor. And, and what had happened around that time was a whole set of uh, disasters, if you like. So there'd been a, a ferry sinking, um, a, another pleasure boat sinking on the Thames, the King's Cross fire, and a, a school cruise ship sinking. It had all happened around the same time. And large numbers of the survivors of these disasters were coming through the Institute of Psychiatry to be assessed, mostly adults, for whether they had this new, relatively new diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, which had been introduced about six or seven years earlier into the DSM. But as well as all those adults, we, they also brought their children. And in fact, in, in terms of the Jupiter ship, they were, they were all young people. And we were also assessing these children. And what we found was that lots of the problems that the adults were facing were mirrored in the children, and if not worse, which was very different from the kind of collective understanding at that time, which is that children can take these kind of events in their stride. We don't need to worry about traumatic stress in young people. And this was a real revolution. And I think for Bill, it was a real eye-opener and actually completely changed the direction of his career. So we spent hours and hours seeing hun literally hundreds of children and young people uh, at that time and thinking about what might be going on for them, what we might be able to do about it, and that really gave, gave birth to a 30-year research collaboration, which is still going on. I had a meeting with Bill about research only last week. Um, so what we know now is that actually children uh, do suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. And I don't think I need, for any of you here, tell you what the symptoms are and the presentations are of, of this condition. But they have profound re-experiencing of these awful events. They have profound avoidance of reminders of talking about it, <coughs> withdrawal. And what we discovered really was that the, the, the patterns of symptoms were overlapping a lot with the adult presentation, but also crucially different. So there were delays in developmental milestones, um, reversals of developmental milestones, 
lots of conduct problems, lots of behavioral problems, and lots of acting out of the trauma in play and interactions with family and, and, and other, other kids. So all these differences and similarities were uh, an inspiration to try and think what we, what we might be able to do about it. And now we know actually that vast majority of young people will have experienced the kinds of traumatic events that we started to see 30 years ago. It's the norm rather than the uh, exception. Though in the in initial instantiations of PTSD, it was abnormal events outside of the range of usual human experience. Now we know that these are completely common events and actually very common reactions. There's a large lifetime prevalence of PTSD and even work that that Bill did following up survivors of the Jupiter cruise ship um, five years later, initial incidence of PTSD was around 70%. But even five years on, um, it was uh, between a quarter and a third of the young people still met criteria for the disorder. So a profound problem, which is also the birth of many problems throughout adulthood, so difficulties in education, difficulties in employment, and a risk factor for psychiatric problems across the life course. So it's a very challenging condition to work with. So I, I did my clinical training and then I applied for my current, what's now my current job. I didn't realize 25 years later I'd still be in the same office. Um, but I applied for a three year uh, postdoc. And um, what, I did, what I thought was I'll put together a program of work <coughs> where we'll start with some theoretical work We'll do some experiments, we'll do some longitudinal studies, we'll develop an intervention, and we'll evaluate it, and we'll try and implement it. This was my three-year postdoc <laughs> uh, program. And it's testament to the people who offered me the job that they just sat there politely smiling, didn't say a word about how ridiculous this was. But I'm pleased to say that 25 years later, we're at least three quarters of the way through, <laughs> uh, three quarters of the way through this program. And this is kind of what it looked like, and it's now been instantiated in the sort of MRs, not because of my postdoc proposal, completely independently, uh, as, a, as a framework for how you might develop complex interventions based on empirical science. So you start with some theory. You then say, well, if this theory is true, can we see evidence of these things in uh, people with this condition or struggling with this problem compared to other people? And then the next question is, well, is there any evidence that these, these are causal, that they're actually changing things across time? And if so, maybe we can develop an intervention that targets these things which we theorized are important and tries to reverse them, and that should get rid of the symptoms. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we can try, if it's successful, to implement it. So this was the, this was the uh, postdoc proposal. So what I'd like to do is really use this as a framework to talk through the, the science that we did um, over, over that period. So starting with the theory, we spent hours and hours discussing and thinking about uh, what might be going on. And we wrote a whole bunch of, a bunch of papers um, together and separately. Um, I wrote this very long paper in the middle. Anyone who's read that deserves some kind of medal. It's extremely long. Even I've not read it, and I wrote, I wrote it. <laughs> but a huge influence uh, in this theoretical area, and, and ever since, it was, was working with David Clark and Anka Ehlers. So going back a bit, when I was an undergraduate, David was my uh, supervisor. So every week I'd get a whole hour of David's time just to myself to talk about clinical psychology. If I wanted an hour of David's time now, I'd have to go through three PAs six months in advance. But every week I could cycle up to his office. And that was just an incredibly invaluable experience. The first thing he said on the first meeting was, Here's the reading, but don't ever read the introductions of these papers or the discussions until you've read the method and the results. Make up your own mind first, and then see what con the author's trying to perpetuate by going back to see what the introduction is. That helped me with writing papers as well, to be honest. I thought, oh, I've been, I've been, been far too honest in my introductions. But a, re a, really, a really strong influence. And their, their cognitive model of PTSD in adults has been incredibly helpful in thinking about how we might work with young people, even though it's very, very cognitive. So we came up with a whole bunch of theoretical ideas, but we can distill them really into what we've called the three M's. And the first is that the important thing you immediately discover is that the way young people remember their trauma is very different to how they remember everything else. 
It's very disjointed. It's very laden with sensory details. Um, so one of the first children that Bill and I saw had been in the ferry sinking. And as soon as this young adolescent started talking about the, what had happened, he'd had to swim for his life away, away from the ferry. His arms started to move like this. And he was unable to talk about what happened without in completely reliving the experience. He, could, he felt wet. He felt like he was drowning. He could hear all the sounds. And this is very different to how people remember even the most negative events in everyday life. So something about the structure of the memory seems like it must have been important. And we, we, we know that, uh, those of us who work in this area. And the other thing which was important, and this came a lot from the work of David and Anka, was the <coughs> meanings. And you have to work quite hard with young people to really notice how important the meanings they project onto the event end up being in terms of how they uh, recover. So these are events that are existentially profoundly challenging. The order of things before the event is completely overturned. So young people's views of who they are, how the world works, how the people around them uh, operate, whether they can be trusted, whether, whether they're malicious, all of these kind of things get turned on their head and a whole new set of meanings take their place. And these meanings, it turns out, are crucial in understanding how their problems evolve over time. So that was something that came out of lots of discussions with young people. And finally, as we all know, the way these things are managed. The, the way that difficulty is managed before a, a difficult event, those, those, those techniques and strategies and skills often don't work in the aftermath of an event. They're just not big enough to deal with the magnitude of the problems that someone's facing. So trying to suppress something, trying not to think about it, works for lots of things. And, um, but it sometimes doesn't work when things are this big and this serious. And when you're working with young people, as you know, it's not just the way they manage and cope, it's the way their family and the parents manage and cope. And lots of collusion around pretending things haven't happened and, and dealing with things in particular ways. So we thought that these three M's, the memory, the meanings and the management, are likely to be critical in unlocking how we might deal with post-traumatic stress in, in, in the young people. And this was actually quite different to how young people with PTSD were being treated at the time, which is essentially exposure therapy. So there was nothing on meanings. There was not too much on the nature of the memories. It was just repeatedly going over the trauma, which, which understandably was a very aversive intervention and op often didn't go down very well. And that's exactly what we were also doing at the Maudsley back in the 80s, exposure-based exposure work. So the first challenge then is to say, well, if this is true, what we should find is that if we get a group of people, um, young people who've been through these experiences and we look at the nature of their memories, trying to do it in an objective, experimental, scientific way, if we look at the kinds of meanings they generate when they're talking about the trauma and its implications for their lives, if we look at the way they manage the situation, those things should all be very, very different to people who've had the same experience but are actually doing okay. If these things are central to post-traumatic stress disorder, we should be able to see differences in those with PTSD, even though they're not in the symptom list than those who were. And those are the first questions we started to ask. And I'll just talk a little bit about some of the things we did. And this is work that um, I did with uh, these two folks. And again, we, we all still work together. Richard Miser Stebman at the top and Patrick, Patrick Smith below. And um, they've been totally wonderful colleagues. And, Richard's a really interesting case. So he was initially a PhD student that Patrick and I uh, supervised, and now he's a professor and by far um, the most knowledgeable of all of us about this area. So the relationship has completely reversed from mentoring someone to being uh, mentored by them. And that's such a, a, love, a lovely experience as you get older to uh, see the people you've worked with just flourish in that way. So fantastic people to work with. And all of the work I'm gonna talk about from now on has been in collaboration with uh, Richard and Patrick, as well as Bill and David and Anka. So we did a bunch of uh, studies. I'll just, I'll just highlight a few. So the first thing we wanted to do was look at the actual narratives of when young people talk about what happened. So we would say, can you tell us about the trauma in your own words? And we'd also ask them to talk about another really negative event they'd experienced, but they didn't conceptualizing the same way as the trauma that they'd had 
and a, also a, a positive event. And then we got a group of people who'd had similar traumatic experiences but weren't so struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder in the same way. What we thought was uh, we should find the narratives of the trauma memories in those with PTSD should be different in the way they're structured from all of the other narratives in the other group and, and, and in the, and the PTSD kids. Um, and so we used sort of <coughs> content analytic techniques to look at the coherence of the narrative, the repetitions, the amount of sensory detail, the fact that it switched rapidly from one thing to another, the disjointedness. So we used all sorts of ways of trying to analyze the nature of those narratives to see are they actually different? Does what we're seeing in the clinic play out in a more objective uh, analysis? So what we've got here on this graph is uh, actually just in the first month after a trauma where we've got young people who meet criteria for an acute stress disorder diagnosis versus those who've had the same experiences but no such diagnosis. Um, we're comparing the memory coherence, though we ha as I said, we had a whole bunch of metrics for the narratives about the trauma and uh, a, a, another unpleasant event. And you can see for those young people who don't have uh, acute stress problems, that those two things are really described in, in very similar ways. Whereas what we found in the young people with acute stress disorder is a, a, quite a profound difference, much more incoherent, disjointed, centrally laden memories um, for, for the traumatic event. And in fact, we find the same thing if we look at PTSD six months later um, and, and a, a number of other ways of measuring it. So as you know, uh, mo men, most of you will work uh, clinically. Um, you really don't have time to do, put narratives through complex um, analytic programs to look at disjointedness and coherence. So the next thing we wanted to do was come up with a quick measure of trauma memory coherence because we thought if we're going to try and use this clinically, trying to do trials and develop an intervention, we need measures that are easy to use for people at the clinical front line. So we came up with this ter terribly named questionnaire. I'm quite, not quite sure why we called it this. The Trauma Memory Modality Questionnaire. I don't even really know what that means. But anyway, it was an 11-item measure that really just looked at the sensorily laden nature of memories and their coherence. Um, and it's a self-report instrument. So these are some of the items. My memories of the event are actually mostly pictures and images. Uh, when I have memories, I sometimes hear things in my head that I heard during the event. When memories come to mind, I feel my body is the same position as when the event occurred. So they're really trying to look at these different ways of remembering. And if we look at those same two groups, you can see that the uh, scores on this measure are higher in the acute stress disorder group compared to the controls. And again, six months later, when they, those ones who go on to develop PTSD compared to the controls. So we had a measure that had face validity, um, had test-retest reliability, seemed to also predict across time, and um, seemed to capture the essence of what we're interested in, and really <coughs> convinced us that there is something different. It's not just a clinical phenomenon that we were uh, imagining from our clinical encounters. There's something fundamentally different about the nature of the remembering of these events. For, for those kids specifically who have PTSD. So next we moved on to the, <coughs> the meanings, and I alluded to this earlier. So repeatedly when you talk to children and young people about these events, they, they say these kinds of things. I feel like I'm going crazy. I'll never be the same again. I don't feel I can trust anyone. Nowhere's safe. And their, their discourse is laden with these quite profound existential comments, which really are, are not just about them and what happened, but about their whole experience of the world. And this seems when you work with it clinically that it must be critical to why they're having such a hard time. If you really believe these things, it's very, very difficult to feel okay. And in fact, when we were trying to theoretically conceptualize this, three types of meanings seemed to, to stand out. The first was meanings about the trauma itself. What did it mean that this happened? What did, what did the individual experiences that you went through mean to you? And some of them are concurrent from the time of the trauma. I, uh, beliefs such as, I'm going to die, I can't escape. Now, on the face of it, these seem relatively easy to deal with. You're, you're, you're working with a young person. 
three months after an event where they thought they were going to die, but clearly they didn't die. But actually, these meanings seem to be trapped in the memory. And this relates to what the memories are like. The memories are frozen in time. So when they remember what happens and they have a memory of thinking they're going to die, they actually feel, again, like they're going to die. So it's not a, memory that, uh, it's not a meaning that can be dismissed easily. So these memories get trapped in the narrative. And part of the challenge is to untrap them. And then there's all the kind of what-if meanings about what happened. Well, I should have fought back. I should have been able to <coughs> prevent it. Um, in fact, one of the fathers of the ferry sinking where uh, the, young, the young man I talked about just now had the profound reliving with the swimming um, believed he should have worked out that the ferry was going to sink somehow, gone up to the bridge and taken control of the ship from the captain in order to prevent it happening. He absolutely consumed with guilt that he hadn't done this. So it's totally irrational in one sense. But if you think the alternatives is believing that the world is a place where random events can just kill you out of the blue, it's safer to believe some sense of personal control, however irrational it is. So these meanings are very powerful and they, they support fragile, in a fragile way, models of the world that are about ways you could have controlled things because the alternative is too disturbing to uh, contemplate. And then there's meanings about the symptoms. Lots of young people understandably have no idea what PTSD is. They don't understand why they're waking up every night with nightmares while they, they suddenly lose their temper for no reason, while they're watching something on the TV and they suddenly have a flashback. They just don't know what's going on. Um, so they think they're losing their mind and they'll never be the same again. And they don't talk about it, so they don't get any reassurance. In fact, if they think, they think if they talk about it, they'll f lose control, because when they talk about it, they get upset. So meaning's about the symptoms. And then perhaps most disturbingly are these global meanings. I'm permanently damaged, I'm weak, I'm doomed. The world is a dangerous place. Bad things will always happen. You can't trust anybody. Um, so different types of meanings. So again, what we, <coughs> what we wanted to do was come up with a measure that could capture these meanings in a way that could be used, used in the clinic. And similar work had, had gone on in adults by Edna Ferrer and David Clark and Anne Karelas. Um, and so we tried to bring that to a, uh, a younger uh, demographic. So we adapted uh, this post-traumatic cognitions inventory in the adult literature for children and young people. And it, it delivers two separate subscales. The first is a sense of disturbing and permanent change, as we labelled it, that the children really uh, feel. And the other is uh, a sense of existential danger and horror about the world, that they're a fragile person in a world that's going to overwhelm them. So these are some of the items. Again, my reactions since the event mean I must be going crazy. <coughs> Something terrible will happen if I can't control my thoughts. The frightening event has changed me forever. I can't cope when things get tough. I can't stop bad things from happening to me. I don't trust anybody. And again, we looked at these scores in our groups of young people with PTSD and without PTSD. And these, I should have said it before, these are a group of mixed uh, young people who've mostly experienced violent assaults, domestic violence, and accidents of various kinds, medical accidents, road traffic accidents. So they're a sort of multiple trauma group. And again, you find that they score much higher on this measure than the young people who've had similar experiences but don't have s profound symptoms of PTSD. And um, this is the permanent and disturbing change scores, and this is the fragile person in a scary world subscale. But this is showing that the measure is consistent across the age range, so it's, it's not insensitive in the younger children, and it's also consistent across sex and gender. So it's a, it's, a, it's a robust measure that is sensitive to this concept of disturbed meanings, which seems to characterize those kids who really struggle after these events. We also did a whole load of studies on, on core cognitive processes as well, and I won't go into those, but 
and anyone who's interested in sort of experimental cognitive science, they'll recognize these kind of studies showing that as well as these disturbed meanings and the, the memory uh, uh, for the trauma, there's all these low level biases in attention and memory and judgment that support those more global, higher level uh, disturbed thoughts. So it's a sort of vicious circle um, that anyone who works within a CBT model will, will recognize. And the final M was management. So the first thing is how the children manage what's happening to them. And obviously there's profound behavioral avoidance, um, safety behaviors, like one young kid wouldn't go to sleep at night and would just try and drink endless caffeinated drinks because he's so terrified of the nightmares. And then cognitive management, rumination, endlessly thinking about what they could have done differently. We talked about this before. I should have done this, I should have done that. What if I'd done this? What if I hadn't gone out that day? Um, attempts at thought suppression, um, which often backfired, and uh, uh, attempts at continuous distraction. But also management by the parent and others. Lots of collusion with behavioral avoidance. So many kids never, had never been in a car again after a car accident with the collusion of their parents. Um, collusion with the safety behaviours. <coughs> and as we, as we worked in this area more and more, discovering that because for most of these experiences, the children are with their parents, large numbers of the parents also have PTSD about what happened. And they're, they're, they're actively trying to manage their own distress. And that really interferes with how, how well they can help their children. Okay, so we did all these cross-sectional studies. And it's like, well, post-traumatic stress is associated with these incoherent and sensory-laden narratives and all these maladaptive meanings and coping strategies and a whole bunch of cognitive biases. So the question then is, are these mere cognitive curiosities that characterize PTSD but are not fundamental to why it emerged in the first place and will tell us nothing about what we can do to treat it? Or actually, are they fundamentally causal in the evolution of PTSD and its maintenance over, <coughs> over time? So we moved on to a, a, a set of longitudinal studies. And what the longitudinal study design allows us to do is say, well, we can measure these things at one time point and see if they predict how PTSD changes across time. And if they actually drive that change, then that's a good sign that they're causally involved. It's not, it's not obviously a definitive sign, but it's a sign that they're not just, just simply curiosities. They're actually driving the maintenance and evolution of these problems across time. So we did a lot of uh, work on trying to <coughs> elucidate those causal pathways. Um, and I, I'll just try and summarize that, but essentially the model, the model we took was always the same. So we would recruit from accident and emergency departments within the first few days of a trauma. And we'd, we'd evaluate the young people using these measures I've just talked about uh, in terms of meanings, management, and memories of the trauma in those first few weeks. And then we'd look at them at six months later and see, well, what had happened to their symptoms across time? Some of them will have developed PTSD. Some of them will have been fine. And is it those things that we thought were important that we'd shown in our cross-sectional studies that are critically involved in determining those different trajectories across time? So that was the general idea. So this is just an example of a study. So 226 young people recruited from A&E, a variety of um, uh, types of trauma. RTC's road traffic collision here. And you know, a variety of immediate response within emergency care. So you know, a large number of them would have been admitted to hospital, um, quite a few head injuries, uh, and quite serious uh, uh, emergency first aid at the scene in a, in a lot of cases. So uh, a, a range of traumas and a range of initial triaged response to the uh, acute physical impact of the trauma. And the key findings are that the things that we thought were important um, and which came out of our cross-sectional studies all seem to independently predict the emergence of PTSD over time. <coughs> 
So if you are presenting with these dysfunctional meanings, these sensory-laden, disjointed memories, these nascent versions of these poor coping strategies in the first few weeks, you're much more likely to end up uh, with developing uh, PTSD compared to the kids who went on to be relatively okay. And this wasn't the case for all of the factors that seem to be in operation in the adult literature, where there's lots of work showing that things like the severity of the trauma, uh, whether you've had a traumatic event in the past, whether you're female, um, how much social support you have, all of these factors which are critical for determining the evolution of PTSD in adults, we found no evidence that any of those factors played a role in the young people. It was much more focused around the, the, the first three that I've mentioned. And we really noticed that there were four trajectories of change. So some kids um, were really struggling right from the beginning, and that stayed true over six months. Some were fine right from the outset. Quite a lot struggled for a few weeks and a couple of months, but then recovered naturally and were okay. And there's a small number um, who were fine, and then the PTSD symptoms <coughs> developed almost out of nowhere five, six months down the line. So this is just an example of some of the analytic modeling we do. So the, the full model is at the top, but I, rather than go through that, I've just simplified it. And you can see here that at two weeks, we've measured PTSD symptoms and depression symptoms and these maladaptive meanings on our measure. And the, the strongest predictor, these are uh, regression slash correlation coefficients. The strongest predictor of PTSD at three months are these meanings, even when these other factors are accounted for. Similarly, they're the strongest predictor of depression and understandably they're the strongest predictor of themselves. So the meanings that the children give voice to, even in the first couple of weeks after the trauma, are by far the strongest predictor of how well they're going to do over time, which we were surprised by. But this has come out in probably four or five studies independently. And you can see it differs across these trajectories. So the, this is at two weeks post-trauma using that uh, self-report measure. And, so, and then retrospectively looking at which kids turned out to be resilient to recover or be persistent. And so you can see that the young people who were persistent had really very elevated scores on this measure in the first couple of weeks versus those who were fine all the way through had much lower scores. So this measure seems to delineate these different trajectories. And what it also told us um, doing these longitudinal <coughs> studies is what the kind of natural cutoff would be if you wanted to start thinking about an intervention. So we found that when young people did recover, it was around three months after the trauma. So there's very little point, we thought, in doing any kind of proper intervention in the first three months, because large numbers of those people you would be working with um, were going to be fine anyway. And so what you really want to do is be supportive and wait for the first three months and then work with the people who've got persistent problems. Ideally, you'd have all the resources to do everything, but in a world with limited resources, that's by far the best public health response to PTSD in young people. So that gave us the view that we really wanted to try and develop an intervention uh, for that <coughs> three month onwards period. So the next thing was to try and come up with a, a treatment that would target those um, factors that we had thought were important theoretically and had shown to be important in our cross-sectional longitudinal studies. So we developed a, uh, a treatment <coughs> which owes a lot to the Ayers and Clark treatment in adults in terms of its focus on, on meanings, um, but also has lots of work on restructuring memories and working on management strategies in the children and their, pa and their parents. And the treatment manual for this written by Patrick is... Uh, probably available outside, if anyone's interested. <laughs> so, I mean, this just gives you an idea of uh, what, what, what it involves. It's, a, it's actually a, a 10 to 18 session treatment. We now 
as I'll say later, work with young people who've had chronic and repetitive trauma like abuse, um, domestic violence, where we use a longer a form of the treatment. But essentially, um, the focus is really on working on the, um, on the memories and restructuring the narrative, working on the coping and the management, and all the way through focusing on what meanings emerge from all of the interactions in every session and working on those meanings. So the f having developed the intervention, we did our first RCT, um, which Patrick led on <coughs> back, at the, uh, back at the Maudsley. And the questions we asked ourselves were, does this trauma-focused cognitive therapy, which really tries to restructure the memories work on the meanings and change the coping styles lead to significant remission uh, of PTSD relative to uh, just a wait list to start with. We could have done relative to usual care because there's, there were no, there's no interventions at this time for this group of people really in the NHS. In fact, that's still sadly uh, pretty much true. Um, and critically, do the, do the factors that we think are important, the meanings, the memories, the management, are they driving the therapeutic change? So we're going to try and work on those factors, and is it the changes we manage to make on those factors that's driving the improvement? So in other words, is the therapy working um, in the way that we think it is? So this should be a relatively straightforward thing to show, but actually, as, as many of you will know, the history of CBT is that all attempts to show that CBT works by changing cognitions have pretty much failed. So when you look at these analyses in most CBT trials, the cognitions change as much in, with antidepressants, say, as they do CBT for depression, and you find no evidence for specific mechanisms of cognitive change for CBT. So although this was our hypothesis, we didn't really anticipate being able to support it, but it's important to, to, to try, and, try and understand it anyway. So I'll just show you some of the uh, results from the first trial. So um, this is the group of young people who had the um, trauma-focused CBT, and this is our waitlist control. And these are scores on the uh, trial post-traumatic stress scale, so they're PTSD symptoms. And as you can see, from pre-intervention, pretty much every child's symptoms go down to zero, and they they persist at six months follow-up. Whereas for the wait list, who we then did offer treatment to, there's very little change. And these, these results are way stronger than we could possibly have anticipated. We expected there to be at least some children who didn't respond. And this is a small trial, I think 14 children in each group, but all 14 children responded 100% to the intervention. I'd, I, I mean, in my clinical work, I'd never experience that. Most people don't, don't seem to get that much better, but um, this, was a, this was a real revelation to us. And we found similar effects in, in depression, not, not so strong, um, weight list, no change, and then sustained effects um, across time from the treatment, and similar effects with anxiety. And so we did mediation analyses to say, well, we know that um, we know that whether you're allocated randomly to the, the trauma-focused CBT group or the wait list is going to determine whether you recover or not. That's the main effect of the trial. But is that recovery mediated by, for example, change in the meanings that you ascribe to the trauma? And we find that, well, the meanings change much more in the group who've had the therapy where we're trying to change them and those changes significantly impact the outcome. And when you take this account pathway into account, this direct effect is much reduced, which is evidence for mediation. So evidence that actually, contrary to the history of trying to elucidate cognitive change as a mechanism in CBT generally, there was good evidence that changing the cognitions was really driving the outcome of the treatment. Which if you think about how profound a role these appraisals play in predicting PTSD across time, it's not surprising that they're fundamental to treating it as well. So we next moved on to uh, look at early intervention. 
And so this was the first trial was uh, kids who'd had PTSD for at least six months. And some of them have, had had it for three, four, five years. Um, our next trial was aimed at exactly that three month point that we mentioned. Can we go in at the earliest point when it made sense in a public health model and do the intervention then? This actually proved much more difficult because there was a lot more resistance from parents who were like, well, no, we'll just see how it goes for another however long. The, the children were often already not going to school. Whereas the, the first trial, everybody was really quite desperate because some of these children hadn't been to school for two years, for example. Um, so this was quite an, an eye-opener for us that actually when you're working in the area of trauma, there's a lot of resistance from the parents to talking about it, to acknowledging there's a problem, to allowing their kids to go into a treatment where they're going to have to talk a lot about what happened. And we really struggled with that. Um, but again, um, the graph's essentially the same. Very similar results. This time, um, we followed young people up for a year instead of six months, and it's a larger sample. But the intervention worked just as well as an early intervention, um, bringing s scores on PTSD, symptom measures almost down to floor, which are then maintained for a year. And the effect sizes are really quite, quite big for anyone who's interested in, in effect sizes. Even compared to the wait list, the effect size is of over one um, for PTSD. So again, we were really quite blown away by how effect effective this intervention was. And again, we found similar data <coughs> about the role of changes in cognitions driving the intervention. So this is the wait list pre and post, no changes at all, big reductions on our post-traumatic cognitions measure from pre to post in the treatment. And same with the memory, memory quality, big reductions in the nature of the narrative of the trauma, which isn't surprising because we spent a lot of time restructuring the memories with the young people. So the next thing we wanted to do was perhaps the most challenging, which is this is quite a cognitive intervention. Can we, can we use it in very young children? And is PTSD even really a meaningful concept in three, four, five, six-year-olds? Um, so one of the initial studies we did was uh, part of our longitudinal research is look, apply the DSM diagnosis for PTSD uh, to older, older kids, so 10 to 16-year-olds here, and also to much younger kids. Too. And we, what we found was when you take the diagnosis from the, the DSM and you see if any of these really young children meet those criteria, virtually none of them beat them. But there was a lot of work going on led by Mike Shearinger in the, in the US saying the reason they don't meet these criteria is that these criteria came out of the Vietnam War. They're designed to capture PTSD in military veterans. They're not designed for young people and they're certainly not designed for preschoolers. And if you look at how preschoolers manifest the impact of trauma, it's completely different. Um, and once you adjust uh, the criteria so that they're age appropriate, suddenly you'll see that all these symptoms emerge. And he developed what he called the alter an alternative algorithm, a different way of organizing the same symptoms but adding in new symptoms around dysfunctional play and milestones that I alluded to earlier to try and capture the, in a, in a developmentally appropriate way, the manifestation of these problems. So we applied those criteria to the same groups. And lo and behold, when you do that, you find the instance of PTSD in these young children goes up to the same levels as in the older children. And it's not that the criteria are more relaxed, they're just different. So actually the symptom counts, for want of a better phrase, are the same. It's just that they're, organ they're thought about and conceptualized in a different way. So it's not a relaxation of the criteria, it's just a reframing. So we, uh, we tried to change our intervention <coughs> to make it appropriate for these young children while still preserving the core elements of focusing on meanings, <coughs> uh, memories, and management. So we had no idea um, whether this would be effective because trying to do cognitive work on three, four, five-year-olds is obviously very difficult. But we set out to do a trial um, 
funded by, by the NIHR to do this, which we've only just finished, so we haven't published it yet, but I'm going to tell you the results today. So the, be the absolute best thing about doing this trial was that we had a grant which allowed us to go to the Playmobil store and buy all of the things you'd want if you're working with traumatized kids. And it, it, I don't know why, but Playmobil has everything you would need. It has, <laughs> it has ambulances, hospitals, resuscitation rooms, emergency rooms. It has all the animals that kids might be attacked by. It even has the Grim Reaper, which we didn't buy. <laughs> I don't know why you'd want that in Playmobil. But anyway, so we got loads of Playmobil in. And as you can imagine, the main interactive dialogue with the young children was around play and drawing, but still around the meaning. So we said, well, what happened? Let's build it. And then you, you talk to them and you say, well, if that were true, what, what would be different? And then someone would come in in a car and rescue them. Or, or they'd say, well, what are things like now? So they build their home now where everyone's fine. So just using these techniques, but essentially we're still working on the meanings that they had <coughs> attributed to the trauma, excuse me. So this is our data, which um, we, we've just, as I said, we've just finished and we're writing up at the moment. Um, so again, we, we find <coughs> similar results with um, around 80% of the young people who'd had the cognitive intervention remitted from their PTSD um, diagnosis. And this is a developmentally appropriate algorithm rather than the, the dsm 4 one, whereas no, virtually no remission in the, in the wait list. And we have similar effects again on, on other measures of symptoms. Um, so what we've also done now, um, which is ongoing, is move towards multiple repeated and complex traumas. So this is a longer version of the intervention, which includes work on emotion regulation and social uh, interaction, as well as the, the core components I mentioned earlier. And it came out of a, a case series we did of um, nine kids, four of whom had been involved in domestic violence and then a variety of other horrendous events, rape, torture, attempted murder, sexual abuse, so extremely severe, the traumatized young people, um, aged between eight and 16. Um, and what we did was a case series trying to see whether this intervention could also be useful for, for them. And of course, there's enormous amounts of comorbidity following these kinds of events, but I'm just gonna focus on the, on the post-traumatic stress for today. Um, so we had no dropouts, that was the first thing. Getting young people in to talk about these horrendous things over many hours with a stranger, we, we thought that would be almost untenable, but we had no dropouts. In fact, kids are desperate to talk about this stuff because no one talks to them about it. And what I've done on this graph is I've, I've put the prospects case series against the previous early intervention results. So what you find here is the... Uh, this is the previous study here. This is the previous study wait list, and these are our nine kids. You can see the effects are just as strong, they're just as strong in them as in, um, as in our early intervention kids who'd had a single incident trauma, a road accident, or a violent assault. So it wasn't a diminished effect, um, and they, they, they really took to the intervention. So we've now got funding, and we're halfway through a um, a pragmatic RCT being running CAM services where we go in and train the CAMS clinicians um, to look at whether this extended intervention can help the kinds of traumatized kids that CAMS really struggle to work with. And we're about ha halfway through that trial now. So finally, uh, implementation. Um, so the, the kind of work we did um, led by Richard on uh, this alternative algorithm, whether it identified more young people, was one of a series of studies that led to a complete change in the DSM about how to diagnose PTSD. And in the DSM-5, for the first time, there's now a subtype of PTSD, preschool PTSD for children younger than six. So it's great when work you do changes the, the kind of things that matter, which means not so much in this country, but in America, it means those young kids can access health insurance. Before, they, they, they would have been 
the DSM-4 diagnosis would have missed them completely and they would not have been eligible for help. We also did health economics modeling in, in our trials and I won't go into it in too much detail, but essentially there's this notion of quality adjusted life is, a, a year of life that goes pretty well. And the NHS is willing to spend 20 grand to give you a year of life that goes pretty well. If an intervention gives you a year of life that's going well, but it costs 30 grand, forget it. So that's their kind of rough cutoff. So what you've got to do is say that on the balance of probabilities, our intervention will give a year of quality, uh, of improved quality of life for 20,000 or less. And that's really what this curve, curve shows, that when you get to 20,000, you're around 60% likely to be cost effective. Whereas when it's um, 10,000, <coughs> If you're only willing to spend 10,000, you're actually less than 50% likely to cost effective. So, but at the NHS cutoff, you're doing fine. And that, yeah, that's critical if you want anything to be implemented in the UK. And we were delighted that the new PTSD guidance that came out in December now has trauma-focused CBT, not just our, our intervention, but even the more exposure-based ones, as um, for the first time indicated for uh, children and young people as the first-line treatment. Um, as you all know, sadly, having something in NICE and actually having it available in your local service almost completely uncorrelated, but it's a start. And finally, we've just got funding from the MRC to move to a digital platform. So working with the children and young people, what they've said is they don't want an app because trying to deal with these problems with an app is just pointless. But what they'd like is... Um, little and often contact with a therapist and an app that supports that. And they much prefer five minutes here, a text there, a phone call there um, across a week than an hour with some person who they don't know very well talking about something difficult at a time. You need to do some of that for the memory restructuring. But what we've moved towards is a model where there's an app that supports a lot of that work and it reduces therapist time to about a third or a quarter. The therapists like it because they can see loads more people and they can structure their time. And there's no such thing as DNAs and all the things that they, sorry, kids not attending, which is a problem. So, um, so we've, we're doing this trial now, Optic, with this app, with funding from the MRC. And we've just got the beta version, which we're doing a case series with the young people at the moment, um, with a fantastic software company called Toad. Um, and then we're going to move to a, a, a randomized controlled trial where we're pitching it against face-to-face -face version of the intervention. And that's because the, all the signs from the NHS are is that they're only going to implement e-therapies if they're not inferior to face-to-face -to -face therapies. So you really have to show that they deliver. So that's what we're hoping to do in the next few years. Um, I'm aware of the time. So I've tried to talk about a translational program of work in a kind of narrative from when it all started in the clinic, right back to hopefully the clinic now. And what, what, what you think is gonna take a few years takes a lot longer, that's the main message. Um, but you get to work with some amazing people uh, along the way and compelling evidence for particular structures of cognition which seem to drive this problem. You can then develop treatments that focus on those and evaluate them in trials. You can show they're cost-effective and potentially scalable via e-therapy. So thanks very much for your time and for your patience. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, 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 so the question was around why the severity of the trauma might be a different factor in adults than young people. And... There's, there's lots to say about that. So by severity of trauma, I mean objective severity. So if you, get, if you get people to rate how bad you think that event was, or you look at things like um, what happened in the hospital, what was the triage rating, was there... Con then those factors in adults are strongly predictive of outcome. And I think the reason for that is that if you think about how adults, how adults think about themselves and the world, all of that information is part and parcel of the way they've constructed the world. So they know that something which knocks them unconscious and puts them in hospital for a week is way worse and way more serious than something where they go, go home after an hour. 
But the way young people construct the world is not the same as adults. So the things that make an event severe, and so subjective severity is a big predictor, because it's essentially a version of these meanings. The things that make an event severe for young people are often very, very different. It's like, did I think my mum had abandoned me? And the mum may have just gone to call an ambulance, but they've never talked to mum about this, so they don't know what happened. So they think, my mum abandoned me and I was going to die. And whether they were in hospital or not is neither here nor there. And so what, that's really what we found, was that these objective markers, because they're concordant with adult conceptualizations of the world, are very important in adults, because they're essentially their proxies for meaning. Well, that was obviously something really awful. But for young kids, that's, th those things aren't the same. Does that make sense? <laughs>